This video investigates the motion of a particle with mass as it follows circular geodesics in the equatorial plane around a Schwarzschild mass. It utilizes the magnitude of the velocity 4 vector squared to derive other equations that govern the shape of the orbit and other characteristics such as energy and angular momentum. It uses these to locate and determine the stability of these orbits. So here we are. Here's our mass and the four velocity u mu, the square of the magnitude of the four velocity uh, for a particle with mass following a geodesic is always equal to minus c squared. So we're going to be interested. Here's the mass, the source of our Schwarzschild space time geometry. And we have a mass here in a smaller mass in circular orbits, we're interested in the circular orbits around this Schwarzschild mass. That's what we're going to investigate in this video. And if you remember, the um, four velocity is parallel transported, the tangent vector here is parallel transported around the orbit. And this is a geodesic. Remember, a geodesic is the motion of a particle responding only to the gravitational field, freely falling within that field, and the motion of a freely falling object in the gravitational field is a geodesic. Alright, so a particle with rest mass m0 following a geodesic has a 4 velocity whose magnitude squared is constant, so if we take the magnitude here and the square of it, we get this object here, which we've seen in previous videos, gives us this, is minus c squared. Now this gave us the equation of motion that we've seen in previous videos, in this series on the Schwarzschild geodesics, and here we are. And for circular motion in the equatorial plane, we're going to set theta as pi on 2, so we sign theta pi on 2, where theta is pi on 2 will give us 1, and d theta d tau will be 0. Alright, when we substitute that in, we'll get this object here. So here's our equation, reduced down to this. And in a previous video we found, using killing vectors, we found this here, an expression for the energy of the particle, and we also found an expression for the angular momentum of the particle. <laughs> and when we substitute these in, that further reduces our equation to this. So our equation of motion becomes this. All right. Now we can make a substitution using the chain rule, where we can convert dr d tau, the derivative with respect to proper time of the radial coordinate in terms of dr d phi times d phi d tau and we know we don't yet know what dr d phi is but we know that d phi d tau from the previous page is this object here we found earlier so we can substitute that in we've seen this also in a previous video substitute this in to our equation of motion here we are that gives us this object here here we are and if we go further again just rearranging this I'm looking ultimately to get the r d phi all squared by itself. And we'll do that over the next page. Just notice over here, see this e squared over m0 squared? Um, we ignore the c squared for the moment, but this is the energy per unit mass, the square of that. The energy per unit mass of the square of it. Okay, times the c squared here. Next bit, let's just keep going. A little bit more algebra, rearranging this and so on. We can get the r d phi all squared by itself into this object here. And we might just go a little bit further there and uh, continue just collect some terms on the right there involving energy and constants. And this brings us down to this line here, dr d phi all squared, gives us this object here. And over here, nothing involving the radial coordinate, um, and just purely energy, mass, uh, angular momentum. And, oh, sorry, there is a radial coordinate there. We'll keep going. Next bit. Um, we can find the shape of the orbit of the particle of the particle. We can make the following substitution to find that because ultimately we're heading to find the orbit equation. And that will give us R is 1 over U if we make that substitution. Um, used uh, in Newtonian mechanics as well. So dr d phi gives us dr du times du d phi, the chain rule again. Uh, working through that, remember R is 1 on U, so um, we get over here dr du will be minus 1 on u squared du d phi. So here we go. Let's substitute that in to what we had there on the previous page. dr d phi, and then the square of that, put that in, keep going. And we will remove the r eventually. I was right. We get 1 over u squared times this object here, plus keep going through. 
we see the energy and mass terms and angular momentum on the right here. And du d phi all squared gives us this object here. We're getting closer. Uh, we need to just keep that next bit over. Now our next step is to differentiate both sides with respect to phi. So d d phi of the left and d d phi of the right. Well, on the right there, there's no functions of phi here. We just have energy, angular momentum, and uh, a fixed value for angular momentum here. And this derivative here will disappear, go to zero. And over here, uh, the chain rule, 2 times du d phi times d2 u d phi squared plus 2u 2u du d phi minus here 2gm on c squared times 3u squared du d phi minus here uh, this constant times du d phi. Now this is du d phi throughout. The next thing we can do is divide through by 2 and also divide through by du d phi to give the differential equation that governs the orbital motion with these objects. So this looks familiar to it. It has the same form as the Newtonian version except for the n term. But that n term will vanish for large values of r. Because if you remember, u was 1 on r. So a large value of r will cause this rapidly to go to 0. When it goes to zero and disappears, you end up with the Newtonian equation that governs orbits in Newtonian mechanics. In relativity, general relativity, there's this extra term on the end. So that's how it differs. So this is the differential equation that governs the orbits, the shape of the orbits in general relativity. We're not so much concerned with solving this for all cases. We're interested in this video in the circular case. So let's go over. Now for circular motion, u, which if you remember was equal to 1 over r, is constant because r will be constant. That's the nature of a circle, constant radius all the way around. And so we have dr d tau will be 0, and the second derivative of r with respect to d tau will be 0 as well. So from our orbital equation, the derivative, the second derivative of the front here disappears, and we're left with just this object here. And so what we'll do now, because all of this uh, that's that's all we've got to solve for now, and we're bearing in mind that u will be our constant. So rearranging in terms of u first, and then substituting for r, we get so rearranging this to get l squared, the angular momentum, the square of the angular momentum by itself. We get this object here, remembering that u is constant. So this is the value of our angular momentum. We'll use that shortly, and that implies that if we substitute back in now one on r where u is, we we'll get this object here. So there's our angular momentum. <clears throat> for a given radius. Next bit. So earlier we found in a previous video that dr d tau all squared it is equal to this object here. And uh, we'll just rearrange that a little bit here. And what we will do is that bring this stuff over here onto the left and leave this one on the right. So we have the energy squared over the mass of the particle squared. Okay. And we'll just expand this out a little bit here and take one of the terms over the c squared here. We'll come over to minus c squared. Okay, so we now have an equation of motion here. And what we can do now is by setting the RT tower as zero, this bit will drop out and we'll end up with this object here. And what we've done here is where the L squared was on the previous page, we've substituted in that one over R squared, M squared. Um, and times this object here. And when we expand all of this out, expanding out, we can solve for the square of the energy over the mass, or the energy per unit mass, the square of that, uh, or the energy squared divided by the rest mass energy. That's the square of the rest mass energy. Uh, and then we find is equal to this object here. So we see that the energy of the particle sets a limit for bound orbits. And so that must satisfy for bound orbits. We have uh, E equals M zero C squared. This is um, right out at infinity here. Right out far away that the energy will be equal to the rest mass energy, which is M zero C squared. And so we have E squared on M zero squared C to the four is one. So we have this ratio here as being one right out far away from the source mass. Now we can use this result to solve our equation of motion. If this is going to be, if this ratio is going to be 1, collecting these terms here to make it a little bit easier to solve, 
a more visually obvious what the solution would be. And then we um, find that this being equal to 1, as we said before, for the previous condition about bound orbits, we have 1 minus 2gm on c squared r all squared is 1 minus 3gm on c squared r. And you can see straight away that infinity solves that, r equals infinity, that tends that to 0, that goes to 0, you have 1 squared is equal to 1, so that's the solution. And at the other end, you can have um, r is 4gm on c squared, if you use a computer algebra system as I did, and substituting that even in here, you can see, if you put that in there, you drop that in there, you'll have 2gm on 4gm, the gms will cancel out, the c squared's already gone, you'll have 2 over 4, which is a half, 1 minus a half is a half, square that is a quarter, and over here, if we put it in here, r is 4gm on c squared, the c squareds will cancel out, we'll have 3gm on 4gm, so the um, gms will cancel, and you have 1 minus 3 quarters, which is a quarter, which is what we had over here, so that's also a solution. All right, so what we have now is circular orbits for particles with mass exist from two Schwarzschild radii. This is two times the Schwarzschild radii out to infinity. All right, <clears throat> next bit. So in a previous video, we found that if I d tau squared was L squared on R to the 4 M0 squared. We've actually already used this result, so I snuck that in a little bit earlier. Hope you don't mind. D phi d tau squared is L squared on R to the 4 M0 squared, and that's equal to, if we do the, remember here, if we substitute in, um, we have this object here for the angular momentum, L squared is this bit here, and that gives us this object here. Or we can have d phi d tau squared is this object here, that's what we finally achieve with the um, cancelling of terms here. Now, one thing we notice about this is that this equation cannot be satisfied for values of r, the radial coordinate, 3gm on c squared. If we put that in there, the c squareds will cancel, and we have 3gm minus 3gm, so this is 1 over 0, so that's not defined, that's undefined, so that's not possible. But any value less than 3gm, like 2gm or 1gm, is going to make this negative, and defined d tau squared can't be equal to a negative. And so this equation cannot be satisfied for radial coordinate values less, equal to a less than 3gm on c squared. Um, that's 1.5 Schwarzschild radii, actually. So there are no possible orbits in this region, which is a different result in Newtonian mechanics. All right, from our earlier equation of motion, the r d tau squared, we have this object here. And I'm just repeating what was from a previous earlier slide. And multiply through by half this object here, um, so we, and we've got here, and I've pulled over just the c squared term here. Now we can rewrite that as a half d tau all squared plus this v effective, that's the effective potential, and is equal to this constant over on the right hand side, which is the total energy. So giving us that the effective potential is this object in here. So now here's our effective potential concerning the motion of this particle. And if we do a plot of V effective on C squared, just rescaling it, and R over GM on C squared, for L is 3, 3.75, 2 root 2, 4, 4.5 or 5, no particular reason for those values, they just look good on the, on the plot to show you the different discrete values of the angular momentum. Here we are. Uh, when we plot, starting L equals 3 down the bottom here, L equals 5 in the top here, comparing it with the, the Newtonian potential, this one here, so these are the Schwarzschild potentials. All right, let's just move on a bit more. Okay, now the effective potential can be written as this, so just repeating from earlier, or we can put it in this form here. So either one's convenient, depending on what we want to do. So in this second form here, circular orbits will occur when the potential is a minimum, when the effective potential is a minimum. So dv effective dr is zero. So let's find dv dr of this object here. And when we do that, it gives us this object here. Now safer to use a computer algebra system here, just to be sure. Um, so that's exactly what I did, but rather than go through all the steps with you. Next bit, um, and then we set this to zero. So here's our original equation again, we set it to zero. Um, 
Again, I went for a computer algebra system to solve this rather than do it by hand and also take up a number of slides here in doing it. Um, and perhaps derail the um, point of the uh, what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to show you today. So this gives us two solutions. We get um, 2gm on c squared, which is the Schwarzschild radius, or we get 6gm on c squared, which is three times the Schwarzschild radius. Now only the second solution is viable because any particle at the first radius must continue on into the singularity of the centre, and so it cannot exist in a stable circular orbit. Remember, circular orbits for 3gm on c squared and less did not exist, so there is no stable circular orbit at this coordinate radius. Uh, what about this value here? That's an x bit. So we need to check the second solution for stability. Well, one exists, but let's check it for stability. Is it a stable uh, um, orbit? So let's have a look. We use, and the condition for that is that the second derivative is also zero. So here we are, the second derivative with the effective potential is this object in here, doing the second derivative again with the computer algebra system. And evaluating it now at the, at the radius of interest gives us this object here, which is greater than zero, um, which is good, <laughs> because being greater than zero means that this is a stable orbit. Less than zero would be unstable. Greater than zero, or positive, is a stable orbit. Negative would be a un an unstable orbit. So three times the Schwarzschild radius really is a stable minimum. Okay, uh, stable orbits occur at the minimums of um, the effective potential, and the unstable orbits occur at the maximum of the potential. But that's not the point of this video here. But I just want to use those methods to show that this is a stable orbit in the Schwarzschild geometry, which is that r is six gm on c squared, or three times the Schwarzschild radius. Ah, so the minimum we found is the innermost stable circular orbit for a particle with mass in the Schwarzschild space-time. So three times the Schwarzschild radius is the innermost last stable circular orbit if, uh, before the, um, the, the mass at the centre of the Schwarzschild space-time. Let's just have a look at energy a little bit. So E that we've used in our equations is the total energy of the particle in its orbit, which includes gravitational potential energy. Now at r infinity, I was trying to get at this earlier, but at r infinity, E equals m0 c squared, that's the rest mass energy of the particle. Now, this relationship, as we found earlier, can be expressed as E over m0 c squared is this object here. Now before I had the square of this, and the square of that, and the square of this, and squared over here, and down here, but let's take the square of that on both sides to give us E over m0 c squared. And we'll look at this relationship and we'll see what it tells us. For values of r less than infinity, E is less than m0 c squared, as the particle loses gravitational potential energy as it falls inwards. So for instance, at r equals 6 gm, our innermost stable circular orbit in the Schwarzschild geometry, E over m0 c squared is this object here. Okay, and we're going to substitute for um, for r, we're going to put 6 gm and c squared, and when we do that, what we get, you can even imagine in your head the c squareds cancel, and under here we've got 6 gm, 2 gm on 6 gm, so that's the gms cancel, 2 over 6 is uh, 2 thirds, and you have 1 minus um, 2 thirds, 1 minus 1 third, my apologies, 1 third, sorry, 2 over 6, 1 third, 1 minus 1 third, so you get 2 thirds, and then you get a square root over here, of 1 minus 3 over 6, 1 minus a half, and when you do that, 2 root 2 on 3, which is approximately 0.943. So the, the energy here is about 94.3% of its original starting energy out at infinity. So an orbit way out, far out in the distance, far from the source, infinity if you like, um, the energy, total energy of the particles m0 and c squared, but in the innermost orbit, the total energy is now 94.3% of that. All right, let's look at what happens to our particle if it's not in a circular orbit, but moving with some initial finite amount of angular momentum in the azimuthal direction, so d theta is zero, um, direction near some Schwarzschild mass. Now maybe it's been projected in the azimuthal plane, plane, given some initial amount of angular momentum and shot in the azimuthal direction, but it's now being captured by the Schwarzschild mass, and we can look at the equation that governs that motion. 
So starting here again, we come back to this. We take DD tower of this again. This bit disappears on the right here. Um, and we differentiate this. Remember, we're looking at the angular momentum for fixed values. It's given a fixed amount of angular momentum in the azimuthal direction, but it's experiencing the, um, the curvature of the space time around the Schwarzschild mass, and so it will be drawn towards that mass, it will fall freely towards the, that, that mass. If it's not given enough angular momentum, it will fall inwards and be captured by the mass. Let's differentiate through this object here. Here we go. And checking this with a computer algebra system is how I've got these results here. And we end up with this object here. Okay. And finally, just rearrange that a little bit, and we have our equation of motion, dr, d2r, the second derivative of the radial coordinate with respect to proper time tau, the proper time as measured by a clock that the particle carries with itself. And here's the expression for this. And then what we're going to do now is put some values to this equation for the acceleration of the particle towards the source mass. We'll see why it's towards. And we set the mass, and let's just choose this just for an example so we can have some nice numbers to look at and get a feel for what's going on. We're going to set the, our Schwarzschild mass as the, our sun, which has a mass of 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So that'll be our source, and we're going to have all that mass locked within its Schwarzschild radius for the sun. We'll see what that is shortly. And the particle starts with an angular momentum uh, L to mass M0 ratio of 10 to 1, 10 units of um, uh, angular momentum per unit of mass. Let's have a look at that. Let's see now. At uh, 500,000 Schwarz total radio, that's about um, 1.482 million kilometers out. This acceleration. Notice all of these are negative, it's all towards, when you calculate this you'll see, it's all towards the Schwarzschild mass. This thing has been captured and is accelerating towards the Schwarzschild mass. So we have minus 60.72 meters per second per second. At 50,000 Schwarzschild radii, that's 148,222 kilometers roughly, you have, look at this, minus 6,071.96 meters per second per second towards the Schwarzschild mass. 5,000 Schwarzschild radii, you have this acceleration, 2,500 uh, Schwarzschild radii, this distance, 7,411.1 kilometers, you have minus 2.43 times 10 to the 6 meters per second per second acceleration towards that mass. Keep going, 500 Schwarzschild radii, this amount, 50, now you're only 148.2 kilometers away, and you have an acceleration of 6 billion negative being inwards towards the mass 6 billion meters per second per second. Let's keep going. 10 schwarz type radii. Now you're up to 1 minus 1.52 times 10 to the power of 11. And we keep coming down 5 schwarz type radii. You're only 14.8 kilometers away from the, the mass. You've got minus 6.07 times 10 to the 11. 4 schwarz type radii gets even larger. 3 schwarz type radii. You're down to this object. A 2 schwarz type radii. You're down to minus 3.79 times 10 to the 12. So you've got nearly 4 trillion meters per second per second. And here we go at one Schwartz dial radii, right at the surface of the mass, we have an acceleration of minus 1.52 times 10 to the 13 meters per second per second. And graphically, that looks like this. So we have a plot of acceleration versus radial distance for a Schwartz dial mass equal to that of the sun. And we have uh, the Schwarzschild radius is about 2.95 kilometers. So you imagine the mass of the sun packed into uh, a sphere with radius 2.95 uh, kilometers. So the ratio of the angular momentum L to the particle mass M0 is 10 to 1, so 10 units of angular momentum per unit of mass. And here's our here's a plot here as we start out at 35,000 meters now. 35,000 meters, 35 kilometers out, and we see very quickly the acceleration just takes off. One Schwarzschild radio, the first red line, 1.5 Schwarzschild radio, that's the 3 gm on c squared here, and a 3 Schwarzschild radii, and 4 and 6. But you can see how it accelerates, and all towards a mass. All these values are negative from this.
and it shows you really just the curvature surrounding the Schwarzschild mass. And you can imagine for something much bigger than the sun what that might look like. All right, so in summary, circular orbits for particles with mass exist for the range are greater than 3 gm on c squared, out to infinity. This means that a particle cannot maintain a circular orbit in this range um, for less than this. Um, it cannot uh, maintain a circular orbit, is what I mean by this statement, if the radii is less than this value. Um, and that's no matter how large its angular momentum is. So this is not the case in Newtonian theory. You can have um, orbits at all distances from a mass, close in and, and far out. just depends on how much angular momentum you have. If you have large enough angular momentum, then you can be as close to the mass as you like in your orbit. But that's not the case in general relativity with um, in the Schwarzschild geometry. That's not the case. Um, Now, uh, stable circular orbits exist in the range, stable that is, in the range r equal to greater than 6gm on c squared, out to infinity. And that's it, finished.